15 day workshop on journey from research to publication so i uh, today uh, dr tanya bose is a source person of a day she will present before you the insight into research methodology theoretical approach so i hope you all participate as you have already so i request tanya ma'am uh, please present uh, your idea and discuss with our participants tanya over to you. sure sure sir uh, thank you varun sir i hope i'm audible to everybody yes ma'am okay okay fine yes, okay uh, good morning all of you thank you varun sir and his team for giving me an opportunity to present my ideas with you all in this workshop journey from research to publication now i'm not a pioneer in this field but whatever little knowledge i have i will try to share with all the participants it is a very challenging topic so as the organizers have put a lot of responsibility on my shoulders i'll try to justify it so let's begin with an insight into the research methodology the theoretical approach now what we have been through these four days is research now what is research all about research it is a systematic rigorous investigation of a situation or a problem in order to generate new knowledge or validate existing knowledge some say that it is an endeavor to discover new or collate old facts etc by the scientific study of a subject or by a course of critical investigation so we can say that research is an art of scientific investigation it is a movement from known to unknown it is the pursuit of truth with the help of study observation comparison and experimentation then what are the cycles of a research question development now the main thing in research is the research question now from where do we get this research question through extensive reading generating ideas from those reading and then pondering over the question or we have ideas we work upon the methods and then we move on to the research question so a good research question will point you towards the theory you need to explore the literature you need to review the data you need to gather and the methods you need to use so let me tell you a little about literature review already arun sir has beautifully explained about the literature review in the past days so just to brush up what all questions can be answered by the review of a literature so the first question can be what are the major issues and debate about the research problem are there any research gaps in the knowledge of the subject so this has also been talked about by dr mohit kakkar in his past session how can i bridge this gap what directions or methodology are indicated by the work of other researchers what are the key theories concept ideas known about that subject and what is the chronology of the development of knowledge about my problem another important question whether the research question already has been answered by someone else so once the problem is formulated the researcher should undertake extensive literature review connected with the problem so now you were talking about the journey from research to publication so what is the structure of your manuscript so we begin with the abstract section first so the purpose of the abstract is to briefly introduce the reader the aims of the study the methodology the results and the findings then we move on to the introduction part the purpose of the introduction is to state a clear and overall purpose for the study often framed in a discussion of the need the research is satisfied to define the research questions of the study to give a very brief background of the relevant theory and practice for your topic and then finally we move on to the literature review to summarize what conclusions have been reached in the research literature the motivation behind the study and the research gaps 
sometimes in the research manuscript, these two sections are clubbed into one section only. And in some papers, they are titled as different sections. And after the literature review, the next part that we work upon is the methodology. So today, I will basically focus on the methodology part. Okay. So now, what is a research design or methodology? The research design, it is a master plan specifying the methods and the procedures for collecting and analyzing the needed information. So it constitutes the blueprint for the collection, measurement, and analysis of the data. It is an outline of what the researcher will do from writing the hypothesis and its operational implications to the final analysis of the data. Now, what parts are there in a research design? So keeping in view the above stated design, we may split the overall research design into following four parts. That is the sampling design, the observational design, statistical design, and operational design. Now, what are all these? Sampling design deals with the method of selecting the items to be observed for the given study. Observational design, it relates to the conditions under which the observations are to be made. Statistical design, it concerns with the questions of how many items are to be observed and how the information and gathered data are to be analyzed. And then finally is the operational part. It deals with the techniques by which the procedures specified in the sampling, statistical and observational designs can be carried out. So once we know what is a research design, what all questions do we need to keep in mind while framing the research design? What will be the sample design? What period of time will the study include? What techniques of data collection will be used? How will the data be analyzed? Where can the required data be found? Where will the study be carried out? Why is the study being made? And what is the study about? So if we are able to discuss all these questions or we are able to give the answers to all these questions, then I think we will be able to define a very good research design. Now, next is, what is the need for a research design? Now, it facilitates the smooth sailing of various research operations. It stands for advanced planning of the methods. It helps the researcher to organize his ideas in a form to look for flaws and inadequacies. In the absence of such course of action, it will be difficult to provide comprehensive review of the proposed study. Thus, in a nutshell, research design, it is a plan that specifies the sources and types of information relevant to the research problem. It is a strategy specifying which approach will be used for gathering and analyzing the data. Then, we get confused in these two terminologies. One is research method and the second one is research methodology. Now, what is research method and what is research methodology? Research methods, it refers to the methods or the techniques researchers use in performing the research operations. And what is research methodology? It may be understood as a science of studying how research is done scientifically. In it, we study the various steps that are generally adopted by a researcher in studying his research problem along with the logic behind them. Thus, when we talk for research methodology, we not only talk of the research methods, but also consider the logic behind the methods we use in the context of our research study and explain why we are using a particular method or technique and why are we not using others so that the research results are capable of being evaluated either by the researcher himself or by others. Now, 
some concepts that we deal when we talk about the research design or the research method. The first one is variable. Any characteristic which is subjected to change and can have more than one value, such as age, intelligence, gender, they are classified as variables. Now, for example, okay, now there are two types of variables. The find the uh, first classification that is dependent and independent variables. Now, what are dependent and independent variables? It is very easy. I think everybody knows it. If one variable depends upon or is a consequence of the other variable, it is termed as a dependent variable. And the variable that is antecedent to the dependent variable, it is termed as a independent variable. Now, for instance, if I say that height depends upon age, that means height is a dependent variable and age is an independent variable, right? Okay. Now, there is another classification of variable. We classify variables as qualitative and quantitative variables. Now, what is a qualitative variable? Qualitative variables are those variables that are not numerical and which value fits into the categories. And what is a quantitative variable? It represents a measurable quantity. Further, qualitative variable is classified into nominal and ordinal variables. And quantitative variables, they are classified into discrete and continuous variables. So let us see in the next slides, what are nominal, ordinal, discrete, and continuous variables. So what is a nominal variable? Nominal variable is a qualitative variable where no ordering is possible. Now, for example, if I say that the variable gender it is nominal because there is no order in the fields female or male. I'm not ordering them. So that will be classified as a nominal variable. Similarly, eye color is also an another example of nominal variable because there is no order among the colors of the eye. So I can say blue, brown, or green eyes, or maybe some other color, right? Then is an ordinal variable. Ordinal variable is a qualitative variable with an order implied in the levels. Now, for example, if I say that the variable, the severity of road accidents, it is ordinal because there is a clear order in the levels. When I'm saying the severity of road accidents, that means I mean whether the severity is light, moderate or fatal. So I'm giving an order to the variables. So that will come under ordinal variable. Let's see some more examples. Now, for example, if I say that how was your customer service experience? And I just leave a line, fill it up. So whatever you fill in this, that will be termed as a nominal variable because there is no ordering in that. But if the same question appears in this form, how was your customer service experience? And there are three check boxes, good, neutral, and bad. That means I've given an order to all of them. So the second one becomes an example of a ordinal variable. So I hope the difference between nominal and ordinal is clear to everybody. Then let's see what are discrete variables. Discrete variable is a variable for which the individual values fall on a scale with distinct caps. So they can be counted, right? And what is a continuous variable? A continuous variable, it is a quantitative variable in which we can assume any numerical value within a specific range, right? So it will not take discrete values, it will not take isolated points, but it will take values along a line term. Let's see some examples. So for discrete variable, the examples are number of printing mistakes in a book. So you can count them. Number of road accidents in New Delhi. Number of siblings of an individual. So all you can represent the answers in the form of isolated points. So they will be termed as discrete variables. Now for continuous variable, height of a person, age of a person. So you can see that height and age, they are interrelated. So at different stages of life, your age and your height keeps on changing. 
so you cannot term it as a single isolated point so you have to give the answer in that particular range likewise profit earned by a company so it may vary from month to month right so again the answer will be in the form of an interval okay now next is sampling another important terminology associated with research methods what is sampling measuring a small portion of something and then making a general statement of the whole thing why do we need sampling sampling makes possible the study of a large heterogeneous population with accuracy and with speed let's see what which what are the characteristics for a good sample a good sample should be accurate that means there should be no biasness in the sample i'll give you an example there is a company which is thinking of lowering its price for its soap bar product so after making a survey in the sales of the product in a node mall in makati they concluded that they will not cut down the price of the soap bar since there was an increase in the sales compared to the last year so that means there is a biasness in their study because the company based its decision for the sales of a known mall which has consumers who can afford high price products they did not consider those people or those areas where they have middle class or low class consumers so whenever we are taking a sample there should not be any biasness right and the second characteristic that should be present in a good sample it should be precise because the sample always represents the population let's see an example to understand it customers who visited a particular dress shop they are requested to log in their phone numbers so that they will receive information for discounts and new arrivals so the management they wish to study the customer satisfaction for that shop by means of interviewing through phones they get the comments and the reactions for their client then the samples used are not an exact representative of the population since it is limited only to those customers who log in their phone numbers and they did not consider those customers whose phone numbers were not indicated right so the two important characteristics of a good sample is that the sample should be accurate and it should be precise next is what are the types of sampling we basically have two broad classification of sampling that is probability sampling and non probability sampling probability sampling is further classified into pure random sampling systematic sampling stratified sampling and cluster sampling and non probability sampling is divided into convenient sampling and purposive sampling while the purposive sampling it has further two classification that is quota sampling and judgmental sampling so let us learn about these samplings in the next slides now first is what is a probability sampling probability sampling the sample it is a proportion of the population so it is known as chance sampling also under this sampling every item of the universe has an equal chance of inclusion in the sample so along with the diagram it becomes very clear that there are certain chewing gums in this box and when you open that case any one can come out so everyone has an equal chance right okay so now let's study about the different types of probability sampling the first one was pure random sampling in pure random sampling from the population every individual has an equal chance of being selected in the sample so you can see that there are 15 individuals lined up in the population and by random i am just picking up any one person so i have picked up second third tenth and fourteenth so every individual has an equal chance of being selected right so it is also known as lottery or raffle type of sampling it is done with or maybe without replacement and it may be used if the population has no differentiated level sections or classes then the next one is systematic sampling in systematic sampling every clear name in a list may be selected to be included in a sample so you can see that the population has been arranged in a particular order 
in a way and then i am picking up the first person then the fourth person then the seventh person and so on so the interval between the two individuals remains same throughout right so the interval is that there are two persons in between the ones who are being selected so it is also called as interval sampling because there is a gap or interval between each selected unit in the sample and it is used when the subjects or the respondents in the study are arrayed or they are arranged in some systematic or logical manner such as alphabetical arrangement right okay so then we have stratified sampling now in a stratified sampling what happens the process of selecting randomly samples from different strata of the population used in the study now what do you understand by different strata of the population let me give you an example suppose a call center suppose a call center company wants to seek suggestions of their agents for a new marketing strategy for their new services so the variable of interest is age and the four strata that are formed are people with age less than 30 people within the age group of 30 to 40 years people within the age group of 40 to 50 years and then finally people within the age group of 50 to 60 years so they have been put into different strata and then randomly we can select any one from that strata so you can see that under the age group of 30 years the 10th person has been selected between the age group 30 to 40 the second person has been selected between the age group of 40 to 50 the eighth one has been selected and between the age group of 50 to 60 the fifth one has been selected so when we select the sample in this way it is known as stratified sampling and then the last one in probability sampling was cluster sampling what is cluster sampling the total population is divided into it may be two groups or it may be more groups right so the groups they are known as cluster and the sample of group is selected randomly so what is happening in this population the people with the same characteristics they are put into clusters into groups so you can see that these persons are wearing red t-shirts so they have been put in first cluster these people are wearing blue t-shirts so they are put in second cluster and so on and then once the clusters have been formed you can select the clusters randomly so the first cluster the fourth one and the fifth one has been selected right so this way of selecting a sample is called as cluster sampling so with this we finish up with the probability sampling part then is the non probability sampling what is non probability sampling it is that sampling procedure which does not afford any basis for estimating the probability that each item in the population has of being included in the sample so in this type of sampling items for the sample are being selected deliberately by the researcher his choice concerning the items remains supreme so there is no way of selection systematic way of selection so randomness is not present here and the selection it depends upon the situation so let's discuss the different types of non probability sampling the first one was convenience sampling so it is a process of picking out people in the most convenient and fastest way to immediately get their reactions to a certain hot and controversial issue Now, for example, I was told to uh, talk, uh, may, uh, give a talk on this topic, research methodology, and this is my population. So the population consists of some researchers and some layman persons, right? So I know that if I keep the layman people in my group, they will not give me a response. So for my convenience, I selected the sample within the researcher group. so i took it with my convenience and according to the situation that i have at that moment so when you do it on your own will on your convenience that sampling is known as convenience sampling i will give you another example suppose there is a gaming company who wants to know how one of their games is doing good in the market so their analysts they may choose to create an online survey on facebook to rate that game so if they send it to the people who do not play the game they may not be interested to take the survey 
So the survey may be improved greatly if the analysts post it to the fan pages dedicated to the game lovers. Right? Okay. So then we have this purposive sampling. The respondents are chosen on the basis of their knowledge of information desired. And under the purposive sampling, we have quota sampling. What is quota sampling? In quota sampling, specified number of persons of certain types are included in the sample. Now, for example, this is a mixed group of people in the population. And suppose I just want to make a quota that all the male persons above 50 years, I need that in a group in my sample. So I have made a quota. So when I select people under this quota, that sampling is known as quota sampling. And then the final one is the judgmental sampling. Now, in this sampling, the sample is taken based on certain judgments about the overall population. The researcher chooses the sample based on who they think would be appropriate for the study. Now, for example, I, there is a researcher who wants to study on the uh, behavior of beggars, suppose. So, he knows that the three areas in the city where the beggars are found in abundance. So, he will visit only those areas and interview beggars of his choice and convenience. He will not go to other areas where beggars are less. Right? That means he knows before his study that, okay, I will get my information from this part. So I'll go only to those parts without covering the rest of the parts. So that sampling is known as judgmental sampling. Okay. Then, after the sample has been constructed, we start collecting the data. So the next important thing is data collection. What is data collection? It is the most important stage in conducting the research. So the data collection starts with determining what kind of data, qualitative or quantitative, is required, followed by the selection of a sample from a certain population. Then what is the need of data collection? You need the data for analysis, to get the idea about the real-time situation, for comparison between the two situations. Then, what are the types of data do we have? There are two types of data. The broad classifications are primary data. So what are primary data? The data that is collected by the researcher himself. So it is gathered through questionnaires, interviews, observations, etc. And the second one, as the name is secondary data, so the data has been collected, compiled, or written by other researchers, like in books, through journals, through newspapers, etc. Right? So that we have two classifications. One is primary data, data written by himself or collected by himself, and secondary data when you are collecting it from other sources. Right? Okay. Then the processing. So the data has been collected. So now you need to process and analyze that data. So after collection of data, it has to be processed and analyzed. So then the next important thing that comes is, what is hypothesis testing? So before we move on to hypothesis testing, one should be clear about what is a hypothesis. So research hypothesis. When a prediction or a hypothesized relationship is to be tested by scientific methods, it is termed as research hypothesis. It is a predictive statement that relates an independent variable to a dependent variable. Right? So this is the next important thing in your research methodology. So, according to a layman, we can say that a hypothesis is an assumption about the population parameter. A parameter, it is a characteristic of the population, like its mean or variance. The parameter must be identified before the analysis. So, if I say that I want to assume the average weight of this class is 58 kgs. So, this is my hypothesis, right? Okay. Now, what is hypothesis testing? So, what all do we keep in mind while we are doing the hypothesis testing? So making an assumption called hypothesis about a population parameter. So this is the first step. Then we need to collect the sample data. 
then calculating the sample statistics, then using the sample statistics to evaluate the hypothesis. That means how likely is that a hypothesized parameter is correct. And then to test the validity of assumed or hypothetical value of population, we gather sample data and determine the difference between the hypothesized value and the actual value of the sample mean. And then we judge whether the difference is significant or not. So smaller the difference, greater is the likelihood that a hypothesized value for the mean is correct. Larger the difference, smaller is the likelihood. Then the next important thing once you are framing the hypothesis is these two things that is null hypothesis and alternate hypothesis. Now what are they? Null hypothesis, it is written as H0. What is null hypothesis? It represents a theory that has been put forward either because it is believed to be true or because it is used as a basis for an argument and has not been proven. And in an alternative hypo hypothesis, we write it by HA or sometimes it is also written as H1. So what is an alternate hypothesis? It is a statement of what a statistical hypothesis test is set up to be established. So it is any other statement other than the null hypothesis. So let's take some examples of null and alternate hypothesis. Like I just gave you in the last slide that the hypothesis was that I have assumed the average weight of this class to be 58 kgs. So the null hypothesis can be framed as the average weight of the semester 2 student is 58 kg. So I write H0. The symbol for weight is mu. So we write that mu is equal to 58. So average weight, for average, we write it as mu. So mu is equal to 58. Now corresponding to this null hypothesis, how do we frame the alternative hypothesis H1? We say that it is any other statement other than the null hypothesis. So we say that the average weight of the student is not equal to 58 kgs. So we say that H1 mu is not equal to 58. Right? Okay, let's take another example. So I take the example from a courtroom trial. In a courtroom, a defendant is considered not guilty as long as his guilt is not proven. So the prosecutor, he tries to prove the guilt of the defendant only when there is enough charging evidence the defendant is condemned. In the start of the procedure, there are two hypotheses. So H0 is the defendant is not guilty and H1 is the defendant is guilty. So the first one denoted with H0, this will be termed as the null hypothesis and the second one that is H1 this will be termed as the alternative hypothesis, right? Okay, let's take another example. Now, this is in case of chemistry. I'm defining the null hypothesis as application of biofertilizer, the name of that fertilizer is suppose X, do not increase the plant growth. So I want to study that when I apply biofertilizers on these plant, do these plant grow? Right? So there is a question mark on this statement. So it is a hypothesis which the researchers tries to disprove or nullify. Now corresponding to this, what will be the alternate hypothesis? In the alternative hypothesis, H1, we say that the application of biofertilizer X increases the plant growth. So you can see that this plant has been grown. So the alternate hypothesis, it will it is a hypothesis which the researcher will try to prove, right? So I think with the help of these examples, the difference between null and alternate hypothesis is clear to all of them, all of you. Okay. Then is selecting a significance level. Now next important thing. So though any level of significance can be adopted in practice, but we either take 5% or 1% level of significance. Now, what is the meaning of 5% or 1% level of significance? 
Now, when we take five percent as a level of significance, that means alpha is equal to zero point zero five. That means there are about five chances out of hundred that we would reject the null hypothesis. In other words, out of hundred, ninety five percent chances are there that the null hypothesis will be accepted. That is, we are about ninety five percent confident. that we have made the right decision right similarly if i say that the level of significance is 1% that means alpha will be 0.01 that means there are only one chance out of 100 that we would reject the null hypothesis that means out of 100 99% chances is that your null hypothesis will be accepted right and we have 99% confidence level that we have made the right decision so in almost all the studies we normally take 5% or 1% as the level of significance okay then we have one tailed and two tailed tests now what are one tailed and two tailed test now in a two tailed test it is that where the hypothesis about the population parameter is rejected for the value of sample statistics failing into either tail of the distribution so you can see that these two tails they have been marked gray so if your critical value lies in these shaded portion we tend to reject the hypothesis and if it lies within this white portion we tend to accept your hypothesis so since there are two tails in this graph so we call it as a two tailed test then what is a one tailed test there are two types of one tailed test one is a right tailed test and the other one is a left tailed test now what is a one tailed test when the hypothesis about the population parameter is rejected for the value of the sample statistics failing into one side tail of the distribution then it is known as a one tailed test so you can see that in these two diagrams the shaded portion is only towards one of the ends either it is on the right side or it is on the left side so if i talk about this if the critical value lies in the shaded region here then we tend to reject the hypothesis and if it lies in the white portion then we try to accept it and likewise in this if your value lies in the shaded portion we will reject the hypothesis otherwise we will accept it so if the rejection area falls towards the right side it is called the right tail test on the other hand if the rejection reg region falls on the left side it is called the left tail test right thank okay. you then the next step is if our sample statistics falls in a non shaded region just as i told you in the last diagram then it simply means that there is no evidence to reject the null hypothesis so it proves that the null hypothesis is true otherwise it will be rejected so then determination of a suitable test statistics now what are test statistics we can employ to test our hypothesis and then is to determine the critical value from the data right okay then when we try to accept or reject the hypothesis we tend to make some errors also so basically there are two types of errors let's study them what are these errors so the table makes it very clear so we have the acceptance and rejection of null hypothesis on this side and here we have that the null hypothesis is true and the second column is when the alternative hypothesis is true so let's discuss the first one when the null hypothesis is true and we are accepting the hypothesis the null hypothesis that means we are making the right decision isn't it so we are it is true itself and we are accepting it so it is the right one so there is no error here but when the null hypothesis is true and we are rejecting the hypothesis that means we are making a wrong decision and we are making we are tend to create type 1 here right likewise 
your alternative hypothesis is true and you are accept, accepting it that means you are again making a wrong decision and it will create a type 2 error and the last one when the alternate hypothesis is true and you are rejecting the null hypothesis that means you are making the right decision right so we tend to create either type 1 error or type 2 error then what all test statistics can be employed to test our hypothesis? So we have some parametric and non-parametric test. So let's first learn what is a parametric and what is a non-parametric test. And then I'll tell you, I'll give you a list of what are all the parametric tests and what are all the non-parametric tests. So a parametric test, it is applied when your distribution is normal, right? It is applied for a quantitative data. So it is applied when the scale of measurement is a metric scale. So quantitative data, you remember when we can count them, right? So the scale has to be in any interval or a ratio. The questions has means or standard deviation, then the parametric test is used. And it is a very powerful test. And the second one is a non-parametric test. It is applied when there is a skewed distribution in the data. It is applied for qualitative data. So qualitative data, you remember, we discussed about nominal and the ordinal variables. So if your data is being taken on nominal or ordinal scale, then we have to apply the non-parametric test. The questions has percentage or proportions, then non-parametric is applicable. And then it is, obviously, it is less powerful than the parametric tests. Then we have, what all tests are available to us? So under parametric test, we have chi-square test, t-test, pair t-test, ANOVA, and Pearson correlation. While in non-parametric test, we have Fisher exact test, man whitney test, Wilcoxon signed, Rank test, Kruskal's Wallis test, and Spearman correlation. I'm not going to go into the details because it will take another one hour to discuss all these tests in details. So uh, maybe we can conduct another workshop where we can discuss all these tests in details, right? And then when to use the different test statistics. ANOVA, it can be used for comparing the means of maybe more than two samples. A chi-square test, it is for testing goodness of fit to an assumed distribution. S-test, for comparing variances of two samples. T-test, for comparing the mean to a value or the means to two samples. And Z-test, as T-test, but for large samples. So t-test and z-test is almost similar. t-test is applied for small samples, for sample size less than 30. And z-test is applied for large samples, that means for sample size greater than 30. Right? Okay. And then finally, we have learned all about research methodology. Now, what are the benefits of research methodology? So with this, I'll end my session. The, when you prepare the research methodology, it enriches the practitioner and his practices. It enables critical evaluation of literature. It develops special interests and skills. It helps to understand attitude of others. It creates awareness of special needs of research process. And then, it is an advancement of wealth of human knowledge. You get to learn so many things. You start with a different perception, and at the end, you arrive at a different perception, right? It develops a critical and scientific attitude, disciplined thinking, or a bent of mind to observe objectivity. And finally, doing research is the best way to learn, to read, and to think critically. So with this, I end my session and thank you to all the participants for listening to me.
because listening, I find it's a very challenging job. You can speak, but nobody wants to listen, right? So thank you all. Anji, thank you, ma'am. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you for your valuable. I think that uh, we have to be very Your voice is cutting. I'm not able to hear. Hello. Yeah, it's now better. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Now it's better. Your voice was breaking before. Okay. Uh, just a second. Is there? I think it's audible. Oh. Uh, Arun sir, audio audio नहीं आ रहा sir. Audio नहीं आ रहा. So. अभी आपका clear आ रहा sir, but uh, uh, ma'am का नहीं आ रहा sir. Okay. Sir, I have muted myself because uh, there is little uh, problem. So that is why, I'd like, when I to get a question and answer, right? Arun sir, कुछ disturbance है कहीं network में या कुछ ऐसा है, so that's why it's. We uh... I have a discussion in chat. Option. Okay. Um, am I audible? Okay. Uh, Mamta Mama has asked me one question: that what is the difference between cluster and strata sampling? Uh, Mam, if you remember my slides, in strata sampling, the entire population was divided into different strata. And we were out of those strata. We were picking up randomly any one person from that strata. But in cluster sampling, it's the same thing we are doing, but there is a little difference. In cluster, groups are being formed. That means strata is being formed, and that entire strata is being picked up randomly. Right. So we are not picking up one particular person from that strata. 
the whole strata has been picked up. So that becomes cluster sampling. And when we pick up only one person from that strata, that is strata sampling, stratified sampling. I hope it is clear. Okay. Um, which level of significance, 0.01 or 0.05, is preferable? Uh, Ma'am, we can prefer any one of these levels of significance. So there is no as such problem that you can either pick 0 0.01 or you can pick 0 0.05. Most generally, we pick 0 0.05 as a level of significance. Right? And then uh, Sumit sir has asked me that in methodology section, we need to add block diagrams, architecture, etc. Uh, yes, you can add the diagrams that is leading to the methodology that is the design part in your paper. Yes. But I won't be able to tell you about the drawings, uh, the tools that are available for drawing because I don't have the background. So maybe I have to study for that to let you know that answer. Right? Yes. Uh, yes, Gurkiran, ma'am, uh, you have asked me that regarding the statistical part, one tail test, etc. Can you discuss with examples also the slide regarding T test? Yes, uh, I didn't go into details because I just had a limited one hour to me with, uh, to discuss the entire methodology section. Maybe in the next uh, workshop or so, we can deal with each of these tests in detail. And then we can give you certain questions or examples to uh, demonstrate how these tests work on, right? Uh, Joseph ma'am is asking me when to consider one-tailed or a two-tailed test. Now ma'am, whenever in the null hypothesis, suppose we are framing that H0 is, suppose mu is, uh, like I took an example in my slides, that mu is equal to 58 kgs. And in the alternating hypothesis, I'm writing that mu is not equal to 58 kgs. That means that the value of mu, it can be either greater than 58 or it can be less than 58. So both the regions are be considered. So in that case, I will deal with a two-tailed test. But, but but it depends upon how the alternate hypothesis is being framed. But if I suppose make the alternate hypothesis as mu is greater than 58, that means I'm only interested in the values which are greater than 58. So greater than 58 means I will deal with a right-tailed test. And suppose if I make the alternate hypothesis as mu is less than 58, that means I want to only deal with the values of mu which are less than 58. So in that case, I will deal with the left test, right? Yes, uh, in control group and experimental group, yes, the difference that I can just let you know for the time being is that for a control group, the group is, uh, there is no uh, uh, perception for that group. It is the entire one. But when we put some conditions on that group to perform an experiment, that control group becomes an experimental group, right? I think I did not miss any of the questions. Yes, Tanimim, am I audible to you? Yes, sir. Have? Yes, yes, you are okay. audible. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think uh, today we have a very good, had a good, good session, and a lot of queries I have seen with the So, uh, some are asking for an example, and uh, some are asking for clarity. So, we did take up place, just try to give them a and a Okay, okay, sir. And sir, one more thing, I want to give an activity yeah. to all the participants for the evening session that um, yes. we already have been uh, doing the five research papers from the very beginning of this workshop. So just try to find the methodology in that section in your research paper. So we will try to discuss 
and i will try to show some of the uh, techniques in the research methodology part that i was talking about in the in my lecture today so i have my uh, dissertation or thesis i can show you that how the questionnaires are framed how do you make the design how the analysis is being done so i can just uh, take around half an hour to show that rest we can uh, discuss right thank you ma'am uh okay. Um, am i audible to all of you now okay uh, uh thank you very much for joining us today by evening uh, we have a discussion session as tanna ma'am said uh, you already with you a uh, five papers and uh, from these papers you are requested to find out the methodology framed by the authors as per discussion of this webinar and uh, similarly with anjam ma'am we will uh, join all of you and uh, have a special session today so thank you very much for all for joining us and we will meet again at uh, 2 pm today on uh, same platform thank you everyone tell you have the right chat box uh, you can have a personal discussion on your personal respective topic of research uh, with ma'am thank you ma'am thank you for spending lot of time and thank you for all i think ma'am uh, now we should close this session okay sir thank you so much thank you thank you okay.